So there should be a piece of paper near you that says cleansed at the top. And I'm going to start where John left off and then read some more scriptures just as a point of reference. By the way, I'm going to give these prophecies to uh, Rebecca. You can run over here if you would. And <clears throat> if you want a copy of the prophecy, you can see Rebecca. <clears throat> Acts chapter 10, verse 44 I feel like I have a piece of autumn in central Pennsylvania stuck in my throat. <clears throat> Acts chapter 10, verse number 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the words he was giving to Cornelius, you can, by the way, go online and hear John's amazing sermon, which they've all been good. But last week was exceptional. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision, this would be believing Jews, who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. We could just start a Pentecostal division right there, okay? But let's not right now. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And the obvious answer is, Are you out of your freaking mind? No. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. Acts 11, chapter 11, verse number 1. Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles, so this would be the uh, believing Jews back in Jerusalem. Now the apostles and the brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision, who believe, contended with him, saying, you went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter explained to them in order from the beginning, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying. In a trance, I saw a vision, an object descending like a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. When I observed it intently and considered, I saw four-footed animals of the earth. This would be four-footed animals who didn't have the split hoof, you know. This is just, you know, dogs and cats and groundhogs and stuff. When I observed, verse 6, when I observed it intently, I considered, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Peter, rise, Peter, kill, and eat. But I said, not so, Lord, for nothing common. He thinks it's a test. Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean, common meaning it wasn't used in sacred ritual, it's just ordinary. So actually the little plastic cup that we use for communion juice, that would be considered more of a sacred cup or a sacred thing. You don't use this to drink your Pepsi from, you know. So anything, not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven. I wonder if he remembered Jesus saying, it's not what goes into you that, that makes you unclean, it's what comes out of you, you know. I wonder if he remembered that. For nothing common, unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, what God has cleansed, you must not call common or unclean now this was done three times and all were drawn up again into heaven 
And at that very moment, three men, see, I see how prophecy works. Yeah, right? Three times it happened, three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. Then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me. He's pointing at them. There are six Jewish believers he took with him, like double the amount of men that came to him, took them as witness and testimony because he suspected God was up to something. But he suspected it would bend him, it would stretch him, and it would create an opportunity for offense. So he took these uh, with him. And we entered the man's house. Well, there's an offense right there. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house who said to him, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Acts chapter 2, verse number 4, right? Back in Jerusalem. Verse 16, then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus, who was I that I could withstand God? That smart, smart boy, Peter. Good, good job. Verse 18, when they heard these things, they became silent. And they glorified God, saying, Well, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life, or repentance leading to life, eternal life. Now, those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen, the martyrdom way back in uh, chapter uh, 6, maybe, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. I'm going to just put a pin right there and say that the church needs to study the church at Antioch. There was things happening in Antioch that need to be replicated today. And if I had any possible power to determine what kind of church Cornerstone would be, I would say, I want it modeled after Antioch. So the gravity or the center of spiritual movement of the Holy Spirit was beginning to shift. The dove was let, being let go from Jerusalem, and it was flying north to Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they came to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, which would be the Greek Jewish believers, preaching, uh, I'm sorry, the Greek-speaking um, uh, Jews, and Hellenists could even mean straight-up Gentile, but anyway, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. So what he doesn't say is that there was a lot of Jews being saved, and there were a lot Greek-speaking Jews, and there were a lot of Gentiles being saved. Greek-speaking people. Hmm. Verse 22, the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they sent out Barnabas, the encourager, to go as far as Antioch. And when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. By the way, in, in the early chapters of the book of Acts, it's always added to the Lord, added to the Lord. There's something that's going to happen soon, and it's going to be multiplication, multiplied, you know. 
That's yet to come. In Acts chapter 11, verse 25, then Barnabas departed Antioch for Tarshish to seek for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And so it was that for a whole year, they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Why? Because they were no, no longer simply Jews. And they were not being converted to Judaism and then receiving Jesus. They were straight up pagan, unbelieving, ungodly people. And the Spirit of God was falling on them. And they were being saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. The implications are huge. They're very, it's very huge. So I want to walk through in these next uh, 15 minutes or so, um, I want to walk through something uh, we want to talk about here that is this, this thing of cleansing. Because there, there's something in this story that unless you take the time to understand their culture and the people that uh, are represented in this story, we won't, we won't understand uh, fully the impact and the implication is, I'm, I'm telling you, what was happening, what was beginning to happen was like blowing the tops of people's heads off, you know, spiritually speaking. So Peter asks, when he sees the Holy Spirit fall, he asks, is there anyone who would have a problem? I mean, these Cornelius in his house, God-fearing Gentile men, John told us last week, like, if I as a Jew keep a kosher house, dietary restrictions, all of that, and I invite you as a Gentile into my house, that's on me. I can do that. But I know I have a kosher house. But if a Gentile invites me into his house, I have no way of knowing whether he keeps a kosher house. And we don't fully understand how serious this dietary thing was to the Jews. I'd like to get to that in just a moment here. So in other words, when Peter sees the Holy Spirit coming upon Cornelius in his house, and he knows the Holy Spirit has come on, not because there's wind, not because there's fire, not because there's a Shekinah glory that is showing, but because they're praying in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability. It, he could see that huge transformation had just taken place in front of his eyes. If I were Peter, I'd say, listen... Um, <clears throat> I didn't even get to the best point yet, and you guys are all acting Pentecostal on me here, you know? And I, let me finish, just let me finish, and then you can hoop and holler. But while he's speaking, he, he's, all he's shared is Jesus, and apparently that's enough. <laughs> and all of a sudden, these people are filled with the Spirit of God. How deep was the divide between Jew and Gentile? First of all, when the Jews came to Canaan, Joshua and his armies, under the inspiration and power of the Holy Spirit, drove out all the inhabitants as directed by God. So all of what is called and considered to be Israel was delivered from, by David, King David's day, delivered from all influences of Gentiles. They were all driven out. Their idols were smashed. Their places of worship were torn down. And God-fearing Jewish men and women began living in new homes and new fields and a new place and a new land wherein which there were no Gentiles present except for a marauding group of people who would sometimes come in upon them, such as Alexander the Great, such as the Roman legions. And when the, uh, when the Jews 
in the first and second dysphoria were cast around the world by the Assyrians and then by the Babylonians and then by Alexander the Great. There comes the Hellenistic um, influence and then comes the Jew. There's the Latin influence. So now their land had been plundered. So they had gone from a place of theocracy where they had a temple and they had a high priest and they had a priesthood and they had a sacrificial system and they had a law and they followed it and they were the people of God. And then they started getting close to the other Gentiles surrounding them. And as they did, their hearts were turned towards the idols that those Gentiles worshiped. And it was just easier because you could see their God but you can't see Jehovah. It was just easier. And for lots of reasons, they uh, time and time again were drug into idolatry. So by the time that Jesus arrives on the shores of Galilee, as by the time he begins preaching and teaching, then, then what you find out is actually uh, um, Galilee, where Jesus was from, is surrounded by Gentiles. And there was many of them in his city. And, and then outside of Jerusalem, Gentiles everywhere surrounding Jerusalem, some of them even in the cities, Caesarea, uh, places like Tel Aviv today, or the Gentiles all surrounding little pockets of uh, uh, enclaves of Jewish uh, uh, d devout followers. And then they would all trail into the city on the three priests, uh, um, yeah, feast, feast days, you know. So they would all make their way from the countrysides, and they had to navigate through all the Gentile um, surroundings around them. So what they did is they were able to keep circumcision. That sets me apart. They were able to keep their dietary law. That sets me apart. They were able to keep their Sabbath, and that set me apart. All these things were things that they did to keep their identity and their trust and their belief in the one true God. And they put blinders on themselves, literally, uh, and sometimes uh, just spiritually, as they navigated the Gentile areas but here's the thing is that a gentile believe uh, i'm sorry a gentile is not going to do what a leper would do in a in a jewish culture and colony at least the leper would warn you i'm unclean don't touch me don't come near me People who had prepared a dead body, they would be unclean until evening when the sun set, and then they had to go and offer sacrifice and cleanse themselves, etc. But the thing is that the Gentiles, they just came and went. So if you brushed against them, if you came up, if you had conversation with them, you know, what would happen is that after a while, there's, there's this, this thing of like, how do I cleanse myself living in a pagan world? How do I cleanse myself when I've been in the marketplace? Well, I'll, I'll keep circumcision, I'll keep my dietary law, and I'll keep Sabbath. So these things are sacred. These are the things that keep us apart from each other. These are the things that causes us to identify. And by Jesus' day, it was corrupted and perverted so that uh, the religious leaders would have big ceremonies after being in the marketplace. They'd come and wash their hands, make a big show of it, etc. But God was not doing the ritual cleansing as much as he was going the actual cleansing of the human heart. That's where this thing goes. Okay, so... Here's the thing is that Peter is watching Cornelius and his household be filled with the Holy Spirit, and, and his head is about to explode because he's saying, okay, I know this. Um, he's not circumcised. I know that because he's not a proselyte. He, he's, not, he's not converted to Judaism, okay? He's a good man, but he's not circumcised. Circumcision was a seal of their faith, a seal of the covenant. But you know, practically speaking, it went right to the center of their sexuality. And sexuality and idolatry all just kind of gets muddled together in a pagan culture. Someone say amen. So, so, so a Jewish man is like, okay, <clears throat> it's a hard sell. If you want to become a Jew, you got you to gotta do this thing. And... Uh, 
And, and I'm sure there had to be certain people who'd say, I don't get it. Why is, it, why is that? So in, in the Jewish culture, hold on to your ears here. Hold on. Maybe someone wants to tune away right now for your kid's sake. But in a Jewish culture, the foreskin of the penis is considered unclean. So what a man would do would, would be to remove the foreskin, which causes him to be cleansed. Circumcision from circum, you know, there's a, there's a, a going around, a cutting around. I, it makes me shudder just thinking about it. Fortunately, this was done to little boys, you know, right? Most of the time. But the thing is, that for what God was doing was he's saying, I am going to assert my lordship on your maleness, the very center of your sexuality. I am going to assert my lordship, and you must know that purity is found in being husband of one wife by covenant in the fear of God. So Peter knows Cornelius, no matter how good he was, no matter how blessed his alms and his compassionate heart and stuff like that, that man was unclean. Therefore, he was separated from God. Therefore, when he went to Jerusalem, there was a wall that said no Gentiles can go past this. There was another wall, no, no women can go past this. Actually, the wall for the women was worse than the wall for the Gentiles church needs to think that one through and here's the thing is that Peter is watching the Holy Spirit holy is not his first name it's a description of the Spirit of God the Spirit of God is holy the Spirit of holiness this is when the Shekinah, the Shekinah of God moved into the temple and the priests couldn't even stand, they couldn't move, they couldn't navigate, they, couldn't, they could not function in their priestly roles because they were overcome by the holiness of God. And the only thing that was keeping them from dying was a slender thread of grace that was given to them by offering the sacrifices and his circumcision. But that same Shekinah, that same glory of God that filled the temple, that filled the tabernacle. Remember, Jesus purged the temple twice. It makes me wonder what was going on there. But he purged it twice, and God still couldn't find a habitation that would suit him. So he moved across town from the temple to an upper room of 120 people who had put their faith in Jesus, who were waiting for the promise of the Father, who had no idea what's happening next. And the Shekinah of God, the holiness of God came and cleansed them and filled their vessels. And now, um, now they were not separated by a slender line of grace that links to circumcision, that links to the blood of the animal or to a sacrificial system or to a temple, but the slender line of grace that led to Calvary, that, that slender line held them fast. And now God says, I can move into men and to women. I can inhabit them. I can live there. I can be inside of them. How clean must they have been? That same grace is available to you today. Father, I pray 
your blessing on those who are watching online. Lord Jesus, let them just begin to go and perceive and to understand and try to figure out and try to know, Lord Jesus, why it is that cleansing is so crucial. What does cleansing mean? There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilt and stain. Amen. So I need to wrap this up pretty quickly and I'm going to use one, one point. So uh, let's move on to the next point. Here. Do not call unholy what God has cleansed. Peter's revelation is God's no respecter of person. Paul's revelation is God himself accepts and justifies the ungodly. And Jesus' revelation was under the law of Moses. When a leper would touch you, you became unclean. But in this kingdom of God that Jesus has established, what he bought and paid for, when God cleanses a man, when a man or a woman filled with the spirit of God comes to the leper and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he touches the leper, the leper is cleansed. It doesn't come back through, it goes out through. The power of this cleansing, what it does is it allows for the full uh, measure of not just the glory of God, but the spirit of God to dwell inside a man. I am so, so, so incredibly sorry that we reduce it to Pentecost and arguments and divisions when in fact, what this is actually saying, if you look at it underneath all of this, one of the things that God is clearly saying, if you think that praying in tongues is a indication that someone has been filled with the Spirit, then I'm gonna say, if being filled with the Spirit and praying in tongues, that is an indication that God has cleansed the man and he has inhabited the man. He has come inside to live and to dwell in us. How deep is the cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ? Some people are going to be cleansed today in a level and a way they've never understood before. You're going to walk out of here different than when you first came here because you're going to understand that God's spirit is able to dwell inside the heart of a man or woman, which means we are clean. On the day of Pentecost, God had clearly established a new temple. It was people trusting in Jesus, people waiting for the promise of the Father, people expecting Jesus to return eminently. And here what they found out is that he did return eminently for in just it within 40 days or so, the spirit of God was poured out and the spirit of God is none other than the spirit of Jesus Christ. The spirit of Jesus Christ lived with him. It is better in this season. I know it doesn't seem that way. I know that you want to see him face to face and we will see him face to face. And that right there is a testimony to the cleansing power of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we see him face to face, we will be changed, we'll be transformed into his same image and the same likeness because we'll see him just as he is. And I'm just saying, why wait for that? If you see him as he is today, as you see him as the cleansing, 
cleansing the Savior, if you see him as the spirit of the living God, if you see him as the one who not only forgives, but he cleanses, he not only forgives and he cleanses, but he inhabits the bodies of the, uh, of the believers, if he is that, if that's what he is and that's who we are in Jesus Christ, then we carry the Shekinah of God. You have walked into the Holy of Holies. You have walked into the place that high priest could only go once a year and that with the blood only of a sacrifice. But you've come in by the blood of Jesus Christ. Why are we so distracted from being in his presence? Why are we so uh, ashamed of announcing our belief? and our trust in him. Why are we so keeping this good news to ourselves? God obviously cleansed a new temple. So uh, Cornelius had clearly become that new temple. And the sign of the cleansing of the new temple was that when they shared Jesus, the Spirit of God said, that's all I need. You just, it's the testimony of Jesus. You shared the testimony of Jesus. He died on a cross he died for our sins. He was buried and put into the grave. Three days later, he rose from the dead. He appeared to the disciples. He appeared to those who were his early witnesses. And then he was caught up into glory. He ever sits at the right hand of the Father. You and I have Jesus. It is better to have Jesus sitting on the throne than to have him in front of you right now. Don't feel like I wish I could have been there. I wish I would have been chosen. I wish I could have been there and seen him. I wish I could have been there when he fed 5,000. I wish I could have been there when he raised Lazarus from the dead. I wish that. No, let me tell you, brothers and sisters, I am so grateful that we live on this side of Pentecost. I am so grateful because the the power of God is still moving and the spirit of God is still moving and Jesus is still alive and he's still returning and there's still a lost world that needs him desperately. Would you please stand with me? Father, I thank you for this day and this hour. I thank you, Lord, that we get, we get to. It's not, we have to share Jesus. We get to share Jesus. It is our joy. It is our delight. Please forgive us. Sometimes we just get distracted. But we stand here today a people willing to follow the dove. We're willing to let him go and to follow him wherever he leads, to follow him wherever dangerous place, dangerous conversation, whatever place, whatever culture, whatever place that the Spirit of God wants to go, we're along for the ride. And we so desperately need the Spirit of God to be released in this world. But without the Spirit of God, where is the conviction of the heart of man? Without the Spirit of God, where is the direction by divine means without the spirit of god where is the ability to see into a man's heart without the spirit of god where is the ability to prophesy a man's and uh, uh, just begin to expose a man or a woman's heart without the spirit of god how can we speak mysteries without the spirit of god how can we rightly divide the word into a word for right now. How can we do that? The spirit of the living God fall fresh on me. Fall fresh on me. Fall fresh on us. It's not insignificant that the Spirit of God led Barnabas 
Oh God, give us more Barnabas. Is give us more people with this spirit that was on Barnabas. He took the risk. He went and found the most dangerous man he knew, but he had heard a testimony that this man had received Christ. As Ryan had shared with us weeks ago, God was speaking to Saul of Tarsus in the backside of a desert, and he was giving him a revelation. And the revelation was that in Christ, the wall of separation has been torn down. That in Christ, Ishmael and Isaac worship together. That in Christ, the Muslim is welcomed to the table. In Christ, the Hindu is welcomed to the table. In Christ, the Hindu is welcomed to the table. In Christ, the atheist, the agnostic is invited to the table. In Christ, every nation, tribe, and tongue, we don't tolerate, we celebrate cultures. Beautiful, beautiful people, red and yellow, black and white, have become offensive words. But in the scriptures, we see every nation, tribe, and tongue standing before the throne of God because there's a crystal stream that is flowing from the throne of God. And the crystal stream cleanses it cleanses us. It heals us. Underneath that cleansing stream, we are truly brothers and sisters in Christ. So, Father, I'm asking today that this body of believers would first of all know how clean they are because the Spirit of God has been poured out on them. And secondly, cleansing stream is flowing and there are pagans there are ungodly there are people who have lived reprehensible lives but when the spirit of God begins to transform the human heart then God is able to put a tabernacle there so we pray We'd be people who open our arms and welcome those whom you are saving, those whom you are washing, those whom you are cleansing. And Father, I pray that we would return to those cleansing streams again and again ourselves. Come on, someone say amen. We need, I, I need to return to the cleansing streams again and again and again because I am so hopelessly human and so reprehensibly short of the glory of God. But there is a stream. There is a stream. A cleansing stream. <clears throat> Wash the church. Wash your bride. Wash your bride again. And I pray, Father, that you would give us the grace in this week to share this faith with someone else. In Jesus' name we pray.